Thank you and welcome to the December 5th Select Board Meeting. Tonight we have an honor that we have every so often, which is this, to host the uh, ceremonial swearing in of some of our public safety officers who have recently been promoted. Tonight we have the honor of uh, of witnessing the swearing in of Jerry Millar to position of lieutenant and Todd Lang to the position of sergeant. Mr. Musanti, would you like to tell us about this? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm really pleased to uh, have this ceremonial swearing in. These, these promotions have been in effect since August 31st, and uh, uh, one of the uh, many pleasures of being in my uh, position is to work with one of the finest police departments uh, in the Commonwealth, and uh, Jerry and Todd exemplify the best of the Amherst uh, Police Department. Uh, Jerry uh, Millar, uh, on the midnight shift, uh, in a very, very important role, uh, providing leadership and mentoring to our officers, and uh, Officer Lang uh, taking advantage of his uh, many skills uh, and taking on a more of a leadership role in the role of sergeant. So I'd like uh, Chief Livingstone to uh, uh, say a few words, and then we'll, we'll do our, our ceremonial swearing-in with Town Clerk Sandra Burgess. So welcome, and thank you, everybody, friends, family members, and colleagues of the uh, Amherst Police Department. Uh, the town manager put it, put it best. It's, it's always a difficult process uh, for promotions in Amherst. Um, in light of the fact that uh, the uh, officers involved are obviously so well qualified. So um, the town manager and they do took a, a very active role in the promotional process and um, we feel very confident in uh, both Lieutenant Miller's and Sergeant Lang's um, abilities and we really look forward to um, what they're going to bring to the table. So uh, welcome all and congratulations guys. You should be very very proud, so welcome. Okay, um, I'll do you Todd first, okay? So if you would raise your right hand. <clears throat> uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm to faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon you by your appointment as a sergeant for the Amherst Police Department? I do. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And Jerry, if you would raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon you by your appointment as a lieutenant on the Amherst Police Department? I do. Congratulations. Thank Good you. Guys. And um, again, uh, 
mirroring uh, Lieutenant Miller's uh, remarks. I do appreciate it and, uh, and uh, look forward to working with everybody. Thank you very much. for public comment. Larry Kelly, TikTok Citizen. Speaking of public safety, Saturday morning, very early, say around 3 o'clock, 3.30 a.m., if you had need of the Amherst Police Department for an emergency situation and you called APD, you would have had to wait because we had five officers, count them, five, at 202 College Street for a party house which had gotten out of hand. In fact, it had gotten out of hand so badly that they had to call for backup. So who did they call? UMass. Well, guess what? UMass was having their problems too, so they couldn't come. So we had Hadley, two cruisers from Hadley, two cruisers from Amherst College responded. In fact, we should send them a thank you note. So they did an excellent job helping out our police department. But this is getting out of hand. I mean, we had a police officer assaulted with a dangerous weapon, with a stick. And that's at 3.30 in the morning. Now this, I, I mean, the last time I came here to complain about this, the last time I was ticked off was in late September, early October. And what was that incident? The Meadow Street riot. We had rocks and bottles thrown at police officers. You gotta do something. You gotta do something before someone gets seriously injured. Now let me shift gears for a second. That, that ticks me off. But what scares me, what scares me, as a family person, born and raised in this town, if you had called for an ambulance at around that same time, early Saturday morning, you had a medical emergency and you needed help immediately, you would have had to wait because we had three ambulances tied up at UMass with ETOH students. ETOH is shorthand for drunk, passed out drunk. But you have to be careful because they can die, they can choke on their own vomit, as we saw in Florida a week or two ago with that hazing incident. So I'm not saying we don't transport them. By, by all means, we have to transport them. But we had three crews, three ambulances tied up at UMass for that. We had one ambulance tied up in Amherst College for a student, ETOH. So that's four out of our five ambulances. And then I think the fifth one was preoccupied with something you would expect. Someone fell and was injured and needed an ambulance. But at that point, all five ambulances are out. So if you needed an ambulance, you would have had to wait for Northampton to respond. And in medical emergencies, you don't want to be told by the 911 operator, well, sorry, we'll, we'll, we'll get there when we can. And God forbid if you had a major structure fire at that same time, because as I'm sure you know, our ambulances are manned by the firefighters. So at that point, A, all our ambulances are tied up. B, we have no professional firefighters. So we had the entire town was being protected by the student call force. God love them, but they can only man one pumper. And in a major structure fire, that's not enough. So if my house is on fire at 3 o'clock in the morning, I want some of the professionals to respond. So please, could you do something? Thank you. Thank you. 
very much for coming in and expressing your thoughts about that. It is a very serious issue. It's an ongoing challenge, and uh, we're continuing to try to address it. But thank you very much for coming in. Anyone else for public comment? Okay, let me note a couple of things about the agenda this evening. We have sort of a strange agenda. Um, as of Wednesday, there were two additional things on here than are on here now. One of them came off before the agenda got posted, and the other one has come off since then. That is the 645 public hearing uh, for propane storage. That originally had been postponed because it had not been, um, the abutter notices had not gone out, but now I'm assuming that the abutter notices didn't go out because there was a question raised as to whether or not this was even within our jurisdiction. The new information is that it's not because it's state property. It doesn't actually require select board um, permitting on this, only a uh, or I guess it was a license, not a permit from the select board, um, but a permit from the fire chief is required. So that what had originally looked like it would be postponed now is canceled entirely. Select board is not expected to see that issue again. So now we have no timed items until 7 o'clock, which is way more time to fill than I would like to have. So we're going to talk about everything very slowly and in exquisite detail until then, okay? All right, um, let's see. Let us start with the uh, acceptance of affordable housing restrictions. And I know Mr. Zomek is here to comment on that if we uh, need assistance with that. Um, at town meeting, j just a couple of weeks ago, uh, town meeting gave us permission to accept the affordable housing restrictions on two units, uh, or the units, it's four units altogether, I believe, five through 11 at Olympia Drive. These are managed by the Amherst Housing Authority, and town meeting approval is required in order for the select board to accept the affordable housing restrictions on these. Um, you'll recall that during the discussion of that issue, folks were wondering how come the affordable housing restriction that we were accepting was only 15 years? How come these were not actually being put into an affordable, uh, in a permanent affordability restriction, um, how come they weren't there already, and how come we weren't going for something more than 15 years? Um, I've had discussions with Mr. Musanti about this, and my understanding is, and, and Mr. Zomek's um, memo speaks to this also, uh, in that, which is in our packet and is available online for folks, that um, as part of giving money towards the rehabilitation and improvement of these properties, the folks giving money, in this case um, the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, DHCD at the federal level, requires a restriction to be put on it. It's kind of that that's the return for the for the loan or the, the grant of the money. If we were to give away the whole restriction, if we were to permanently restrict the housing now, then we would have kind of no leverage to get money in the future. Um, so the 15 years gives DHCD something that they're looking for and lets us keep the ability to um, to extend that restriction in the in the future for for additional funds. Mr. Zomek, would you like to correct anything wrong that I've said there or uh, add any additional information? No, but I'd be happy to come up here and and say a little bit more about it. I, I'm hoping we don't go into excruciating detail <laughs> to, to, to fill it's time. It's all you, 20 minutes, here we go. <laughs> no, I'm hoping this, Mr. Musanti said this would take five minutes, so. Um, yes, in large part, you are correct. Um, let me just back up a little bit. Um, I have not been involved at a very deep level with this particular restriction, but um, I did talk with staff a little bit today, and we've been in touch with Copeman and Page. But it, let me just quickly summarize. So the restriction that you have in your packet um, was developed by Attorney Sharon Everett at Copeman and Page. Um, it was approved as to form. Um, the content is in line with other restrictions required by DHCD for other, uh, the use of CDBG funds in other, other mini entitlement uh, communities throughout Massachusetts. And the restriction you have before you is in keeping with our past practice um, at other projects where we, through our mini entitlement uh, uh, status, through CD, using CDBG funds, have uh, rehabbed other properties, for instance, at Chestnut Court and Pomeroy Village and, and similar projects. The purpose of the funds is really not to purchase or buy a restriction. That is something that DHCD requires, but the real purpose of the funds is the rehab of the four units. They, for that investment, you are correct, um, Ms. O'Keefe, that, that 
it comes with a 15-year requirement. Other DHCD programs, uh, Mr. Rosenblatt, for instance, reminded me that uh, we, we use CDBG funds to rehab the North Amherst School. That only came with a, those capital funds only came with a five-year restriction on those, on that um, particular building. So it is to, uh, in part, get that restriction so that for a period of time, the property is guaranteed to be affordable at, at the levels outlined uh, in the document. Um, so the, the real purpose of the funds is to pay for the work. The restriction essentially needs to come with it. Unlike CPA, the CPA legislation requires a restriction in perpetuity and that covers the three major um, categories, recreation, conservation, and historic preservation. So we have sought, using when we've used invested CPA funds, restrictions in all three of those categories. So, so a town meeting's question to us, because what they did is they gave us permission to accept this restriction. And their question was, why isn't this property already restricted in perpetuity, why wouldn't we want to, as a town, take steps to assure that this is always part of our affordable housing inventory? Why would we only protect it for 15 years? So that was that was what we were talking about, and I thought that the answer was, in part, this is, this is sort of some leverage on our part to, um, as something that's attractive to the um, donor you know, the lender or the, the granting organization. And that that's why we don't um, restrict it permanently. Or I think that's part of the answer. The other part is that, in essence, any property held by the Amherst Housing Authority, their purpose and mission covers um, um, the affordability piece of, of having property, having um, housing units in town be affordable for residents who are living here now and in the future. In the event that in the next seven, eight, 10, 12, 14, 15 years, the housing authority for some reason ceased to exist, this restriction would live for that period of time. If we were to seek uh, um, a restriction in perpetuity, um, I think there would need to be some sort of um, uh, l uh, greater payment, if you will, because the purpose of the CDBG funds are not to guarantee in perpetuity uh, these properties. You'll also note that in the, um, in the exact wording from DHCD, um, the rehabilitation assistance for investor-owned properties is referenced. And so housing authorities are a little bit of a, they're a different, kind of being, I mean, we can invest uh, CDBG funds in private properties, and what we're getting out of that is a 15-year restriction after which the property then could go back to market rates. In this case, that's not likely to happen because it's owned, operated, and managed by the Amherst Housing Authority, and as part of their mission, it is to provide housing for people in various categories of, uh, of income in Massachusetts and in the region. Questions or comments from Mr. Zomek on the affordable housing restrictions? Mr. Hayden. Yeah, I, I would just, just one, one quick comment. I, I, you know, I, I'd heard the, the request that the town meeting made for the permanent restriction and you know, sort of noticed the 15 year, clearly that's what sparks, uh, sparked the, the question. Um, I'm wondering um, if it's a coincidence that after 15 years, these units will probably need to be rehabilitated again. I mean, typically <clears throat> kitchens and bathrooms after 15 years need uh, significant uh, remodeling. Um, I wanted to imagine for a second as, as uh, the chair was speaking that 15 years are now up and this facility has a permanent um, uh, deed restriction for so that we can only lower income people. Where would the funding have come from you know, would it have come from DHCD? Could have come from CDBG, I guess. Um, I mean, does that does that complicate? You know, in in that cycle of rehabilitation, which is you know, we, it's imperative that these cannot be substandard in any way. And letting it go for 20 years or 25 years might leave them that way. I honestly don't know the an the, the answer to that, but I think. Your conclusion, the two conclusions reached 
here are, are in all likelihood true, which is after 15 years, they will need um, rehab again, uh, 15 to 20. And um, uh, the idea of leverage or that the town getting something in addition to that uh, adds a little um, incentive to do that yet again in 15 years. The other piece of this is that, you know, we are dealing with a large state agency who who um, is accountable to an even larger federal agency. And in fact, this is the minimum standard that, you know, the select board could, you could, it is within your purview to say, we'd like a, a restriction in perpetuity. We could then go back to the housing authority and, and, and move through that process. But this is what DHCD requires of the of the um, agency uh, based on the investment of three hundred and sixty four thousand um, dollars Mr. Busanti, anything you want to comment? Yeah, on? I would just reinforce uh, Mr. Zomek's comments that uh, uh, you know we're comfortable with the fifteen year restriction and um, a key difference on this project compared to many others is that the units that are being rehabilitated with the uh, CDBG money are owned by the housing authority. So they're in the affordable housing business. Um, so the housing authority has uh, great control over the future disposition of these parcels and presumably in the time frame we're talking about, there'll be additional renovation or remodeling work that is required and uh, there'll be a new restriction potentially placed on, on the units if, if and when we do that. So I'm comfortable with it, uh, knowing that these units will remain in the, our affordable housing uh, inventory. So I have to assume that this would be somewhat less attractive to CDBG to give the money to if if the restriction didn't go along with it. And so yes, it's a, well, it's a minimum requirement. Right, but the whole point of if if we had a, a longer requirement on it, then the idea, as I was saying, and as Mr. Hayden was saying, you know, in 15 years when these need more money for rehab, they might say, eh, you know, those already have a they they already have what what they want, the program wants, which is the restriction. So why bother investing in them if we had a longer restriction at that time? So I'm thinking that the restriction goes along with that. That's what CDBG is looking for out of it, and um, right. so. Okay. All right. So that's good enough for me. Um, anybody else have questions or comments about this? Ms. Stein, would you like to make a motion? <coughs> Looking over at Ms. Brewer, see if she's putting her hand there. But. Oh, no. oh, good. <laughs> I move that the select board accept the affordable housing restriction and deferred payment mortgage for number 5.211 Olympia Drive from the Amherst Housing Authority on behalf of the town of Amherst as authorized by Article 7 of the November 7th, 2011 Special Town Meeting. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. And I have those for us to sign, so make sure no one leaves tonight without signing them. Thank you Great. very much. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for coming. I appreciate your help. Okay, what time is it? Oh, we got seven more minutes. Let's see what else we can do here. Yes, you can. Why not? Why not? <laughs> so one of the things we'd asked for when we thought we were still going to have to do the gas thing is we'd asked for some guidance saying, what do we even do with these? Because we hadn't had to do one before. And we got this piece of information that I'm guessing may have come from Copeland and Page. It doesn't say. And it's not dated. So yet another wonderful mystery document. So I wonder if we happen to know where this came from so we can label it appropriately. Once it went off our agenda, I stopped paying attention to it. Do you know? Oh, there was a e copy of an email from Attorney Riley at Copeland and Page. Yeah, I missed it in the middle here someplace. Blah, 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 Stan Sheffitz, Brian Riley, the BF CMR. Yeah, okay, I still don't know. But you know what? I could probably just ask Deborah. That might make the most sense. Okay. There is this, yes, there is this email from Brian Riley here that talks about it, but it doesn't say, by the way, go look at this other thing. Yeah, so, talking to your mic and not yeah, mumble. So my, my problem is that, you know, we have this guidance document that I was going to file away for future use, but I don't know where it came from and I don't know what the date is. So we will, um, 
We'll see where that came from because I'm sure Deborah will know. So. I'm sure she will. And, uh, awesome. and now she's collected a folder about yeah. the select board's uh, role in propane storage licensing. So, uh, Which is great because you so never You'll know. get it again. You don't need to file it this yeah. time. You'll get it again. All right. Excellent. <laughs> all right. Other items. We have, um, all right, let's do the easier stuff first. How about plenty of points? Anything easy? Yeah, let's do the, uh, the licenses are pretty easy unless people think those are complicated. Can we go through the license renewals? Okay, so December is the time of year that we renew the annual licenses. These are all of the licenses that the select board uh, has to approve each year. These are for various kinds of business licenses, um, alcohol licenses, taxi business and driver licenses, secondhand sale licenses, common vitular licenses, all kinds of things like that. Um, there are so many of these that happen that they have been broken into groups uh, based on how much the office could get done in time for this particular meeting. So uh, at this meeting, we are dealing with, um, we have two sets of licenses that are essentially alcohol-related and non-alcohol at this point. Next week, we'll be doing taxi licenses. And when we deal with the taxi licenses, we'll also be talking about um, some planned new taxi policy for the following year, 2013. Um, but at this point, we have just the business licenses that are non-taxi, and they are separated into two packets, as I said, the ones that include an alcohol license and the ones that don't. Um, does anybody have any questions about the two packets of information, Ms. Stein? I just wondered about the pending insurance and um, what? Certificates of inspection. Yes. So that's the status of... Um, of the renewal process within the office. So right. even if we approve it, no license can be granted until all of the their paperwork is taken care of. Okay. And would you like a motion? Sure. I'm I'm changing it slightly. Okay. Just slightly. I move that the select board renew the list <clears throat> of alcohol and non-alcohol license presented dated December 2nd, 2011 subject to receipt of documentation noted as pending for the calendar year beginning January 1, 2012 through December 31st, 2012. Second. Further discussion, Mr. Hayden. I'm, uh, the, the pending insurance is up to the, each of the firms to, to secure, of course. Um, I'm concerned about the number of inspections that look like need to be done before the end of year or these businesses might have to close temporarily until those inspections are completed. Are we gonna be able to get to all of these? There's a lot of them here. Mr. Misanti. Uh, my understanding is that's not an atypical number for okay. this time of the month. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's anticipated that uh, they'll be done. Yeah. Uh, further questions or comments? Uh, Ms. Stein, could you clarify where your change was in the motion? Um, I ch just, it's a simple one. Um, it says that the select board renew the list of alcohol rather than have renew renewals. Okay? That the select board renew the list of alcohol and non-alcohol. Approve so the on. list. We don't yeah. renew the list. Approve the approve list. Approve the list. Okay. The motion did say renew. Approve yeah. the list. To approve the list of alcohol and non-alcohol licenses. Mm -hmm. Licenses is presented. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. Further discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 That's unanimous. Thank you. All right. So as I said, we'll have another whole bunch of those next week. Um, primarily taxi driver and license uh, business. Okay. Six fifty nine. So six fifty nine, as we like to say, is the same as seven o'clock. And for our seven o'clock item, we have a public hearing. Uh, our annual public hearing on property tax classification. And we have a great deal of information in our packets, also on the website, both in our packets and on the uh, assessor's site to talk about um, valuations and tax classification information. Here to talk to us tonight, we have Principal Assessor David Burgess, we have Chair of the Board of Assessors, Carl Mailer, and we have Finance Director Sandy Pooler. And I'm going to call this public hearing to order at 7 o'clock. 
and welcome. Thank you very much for coming in. This is uh, something that the Select Board has to do annually that sets the tax rate and does a couple of other things. Um, and it, this year is a revaluation year, so that makes things a little bit more interesting as far as people paying attention to all of this information. So um, why don't you kind of give us an overview of what's going on, and then we will ask our questions. Well, if you will bear with me, I'll just give you a quick overview of the revaluation first off. Please. As you said, this is a certification year. There are, every three years we have to certif certify values with the Department of Revenue. And we just got final word today that the Department of Revenue has accepted our final values and they've accepted our new growth. <coughs> so we're all set with that. This was an unusual year for the second time since I came here 21 years ago. Uh, this, we have lowered the values on the residential properties overall. Not everybody's value went down but uh, about 90% of the residential properties did go down in valuation. Those that didn't go down, uh, they were, their market values were holding, so they stayed up. And we also have some properties that new growth, and of course, properties that were built this year, such as the Lord Jeff, they went up in value quite a bit, so, as you can imagine. The nuts and bolts are that with the, va the valuations going down, the tax rate has gone up. Um, after settling the values finally today, I estimate that the tax rate will be $19.65 per thousand, even though it says in your uh, book 1963 that was an estimate early on in the game before the values were set. Uh, this means that even though uh, values have gone down, most people will still see an increase in their taxes. By my estimation, unless your value went down by at least 7%, you will pay more in taxes than you did last year. Uh, and commercials, because they only went down about 2% uh, overall, and residential went down between 45 and 5%, they will see a bigger increase in the amount of taxes they paid this coming year. This coming year, the commercials will uh, be picking up 10.15% of the uh, base instead of what was about nine point something last year. So they're also picking up slightly more. Part of that is due to the fact that Western Mass Electric Company uh, had a large increase in their new growth, which about six million dollars, which helped us greatly, or else we would really have trouble this year with new growth. That in a nutshell is the revaluation. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask any questions about that or just go straight into the classification. Uh, let's start with questions on revaluation. And before we do that, um, just to point folks specifically to a couple of documents on the website. Uh, one of them is this great colorful document, everything you always wanted to know about real estate taxes in a declining market. <laughs> that was an one. adaptation. It actually said in the market. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, the other one, I don't know if I have the hard copy of, um, but it was something similar like um, it, it was a description of, of how the how the tax rate is calculated. It's a bit more realistic. It shows the values, uh, using the actual values and the actual levy for the town of Amherst and how we calculate the tax rate for the, uh, that point. And it's a bit more uh, in depth, a little bit more serious than the, than the photographs. They're both good things for folks to take a look at. Those are on the website and, um, and I encourage people to look because um, this is always confusing to folks. It's confusing in all kinds of different ways. Um, and so uh, I really appreciate all the effort that was put into trying to explain all of this this year. Uh, well, uh, could I just mention one other thing? <coughs> Please. It's very important for people to realize that the valuations are based on properties that sold in 2010, not 2011. <coughs> the assessment lien date is January 1st, 2011. So people are going to see their houses are selling now and they may still be may, may be selling for even less than they did in 2010, but for the purposes of uh, appeals and re, uh, this year's revaluation, only the properties that sold in 2010 were used. Those that are selling in 2011 we will set for the FY 2013 uh, taxes. Thank you. I apologize. I'm kind of stuffy today. <laughs> I'm getting stuffier by the moment. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Questions or comments from the select board? No, but I thought it was very clear. 
Mr. Hayden. Just a quick question about the process. <laughs> if um, a homeowner were to want to discuss with you their, their new valuation, how would they go about doing that? Well, at this time, uh, it's too late to discuss it before the tax bills go out. So what they'll need to do is when the tax bill goes out, and not before, but after the tax bill goes out, and on or before the 1st of February, when the third quarter tax bill is due, they will have to file an abatement application. I would be happy to discuss it with people, but I prefer them to file the abatement application so that it's done timely and we can act on it rather than not file it. Talk to me and then decide not to file it and then think about it later and not have time to file it. I prefer to have it and deny it instead of them not get the opportunity to file. Thank you. At the risk of setting myself off on a choking spasm again. Um, Letters went out to folks starting in North Amherst this year about um, having the assessors go door to door and inspect your house, or not inspect, but assess your house. Well, actually, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, what's the status of that? Not everybody's gotten those letters. Some people said, you know, no one's ever come to my house and checked out anything. What should people know about that process? Well, that is the problem. Uh, we haven't uh, gone door to door in about 20 years, and we need to do that. The Department of Revenue reckons that we should do it every 10 years. So uh, we started that this year, and in fact, a lot of the properties we have found out that the uh, condition and the age has shown, they're showing a little bit of wear on the, some of the properties, and so they've actually gone down a little bit, those properties. We may go in and find out there's not the number of bedrooms and bathrooms that we thought there were, and, and honestly, in some, in a few, we've gone in and found out there are more bedrooms, more bathrooms, there's been additions put on, basements have been finished, and those properties have seen an increase in value. Uh, it is good that we can inside them, and generally it will benefit everyone. It will equalize the values. We are about 20% finished, and I would hope over the next two to three years, probably two years, we'll finish the whole town. Obviously this year, um, Mrs. Tarati, who worked for, me, worked for me, did most of the work. I was tied up with the revaluation, but her and I, starting in the spring, will be out uh, starting in all their neighborhoods to get them finished. Thank you. Mr. Pooler. Uh, Mr. Pooler is telling me I should uh, tell you where you can find some information on the web. If you go to the assessor's web page, you can go right in there and find it. They're also on the uh, front page of the, um, as you enter the web site, uh, there's a banner that has a picture the same as this on it that you can click on and that will lead you right into it. All of these documents are on there. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that Mr. Miller and Mr. Pooler are here. That's all right, I mentioned it at the beginning. You're all set. <laughs> okay, any other questions about the revaluations? No. All right, moving on. Okay. Well, as you said, this is the time of year that you have to, the, the select board makes the decisions and you are the only people that can make decisions on whether we're going to split the tax rate, in other words, have a higher tax rate on commercial, industrial, and personal than we do in residential, grant a, a small commercial or residential exemption, or grant an a open space discount, and that is why we're here tonight, that you have to decide on those. It has been the history that the we have never split the tax rate, and I don't, I can, walk through this presentation with you. It's a little bit different than it has been in the past. I think it's more, a bit clearer. But in effect, the first two pages are showing you what would the impact would be of a split rate on the uh, properties. If we move 25%, increase the tax rate by 25% on the commercials, it would drop the tax rate for the residentials by about 56 cents and increase the commercial by a little over, just under $5. If we went to the maximum, which is 175%, the tax rate for the uh, residentials would be $17.96. In other words, it'd be saving about $1.69 a thousand. And the commercials would be spent $34.35, up about $16. So it, it's a big, big difference. And this year in particular with the uh, swing on the valuations, what we're looking at, the sing average single family home in 2011 was valued at $334,600 and paid the tax, this does not include CPA, 
of $6,090. And the commercial property was valued at $359,000 and paid $6,534. This coming year, the average single family property will, spend, will pay $6,268, or roughly uh, $178 more, by 2.9%. The average commercial will pay $6,965. That's up $697, or 11.12% over last year. So they, they, they have taken a big increase. Uh, so that is one of the things you'd have to weigh uh, if you decide to split the tax rate. We do not have any open space. We class it all under uh, Backland, so they already get a discount, and then that's included in the tax rate we have now. That is an assessor's decision whether to have open space or not. The residential exemption, which we've uh, talked about many times, means that uh, we can shift 20% of the average assessed valuation, up to 20% of the average assessed valuation, uh, and take that off the property values. Uh, this would mean we'd split, change the tax rate on all properties within the residential class. And at, at the midway point, or slightly above it, properties that are owner-occupied would pay more than they would do under that, even though they would qualify for the exemption. The exemption is a flat exemption of 20% of the average residential property. It is not based on the value of the property itself. So it's not 20% of your individual assessment. It's 20% of the overall. So everybody gets the same amount of the eventual. This means that the lower valued properties that are owner occupied would get a, a, would see a savings, but those that are not owner occupied would see a large increase because they wouldn't get the exemptions, and the ones above the med median point would see the uh, increased tax rate as well because the value the tax rate the exemption would be the same and have less impact for them. Um, you also have the residential or commercial exemption, the small commercial exemption, which is on properties uh, of a million dollars or less, and it's up to 10%, and they have to employ five or more people. We don't, I don't believe we have any properties in town where the business owns a, the building, so this property would not, this would not qualify. Most of our small businesses are in properties that are owned by large property owners. So the property owner would not get the exemption because the property would not get the exemption because it goes with the business, not the exemption, not the property. Those are the items you have to uh, vote on. This year, I have attached some additional information for you. On the back, there's exhibits A, B, C, D, and E. Exhibit A is the LA4, showing the total valuation of all classes of property in town. Exhibit B shows how we calculate the levy limit for this year and how we, how we do it every year. Exhibit C is simply some helpful def, uh, definitions such as levy limit, levy ceiling, things like that. Uh, and D shows us the last year's tax rates and tax shifts for some of the neighboring communities. And Exhibit E shows the breakdown by property class since 1990 for the town of Amherst and covers a wide spectrum just to show you what the split has been for the last 21 years, 20 years. Now it's all yours. <laughs> all right. Uh, questions or comments from select board first on any of these items? Public questions or comments? Oh, select board, Ms. Brewer. Uh, I guess I'm just going to ask Mr. Burgess to reiterate something that he's already nicely covered on page four, and then also it's helpful if people out there in the public heard part of this and, and wondered about it too. And exhibit A is when we talk about we don't have a discount for open space. People are like, wait, we have all this open space. But as you've put here, it's, it's land that's not under 61A, 61B as a permanent conservation. So when you look at all these reasons, we don't have any land, as you've stated here, that actually falls under that. And if people are wondering about where that property shows up, so to speak, in the listing, it shows up in this exhibit that you've attached for us in, in a general sense, because it does show on this exhibit A the Chapter 61A, Chapter 61B land, et cetera. So it's not that it's not doing anything. It's just that it, 
what we call open space in one sense, perhaps in one conversation, is not the same as open space as defined by the assessor. No. The open space that we're talking about that would apply for the discount, but that we already give, is on buildable land or excess land on properties over and above the buildings, uh, over and above, in our case, two acres. We take the first two acres and everybody gets priced in that. And after that, everybody uh, pays uh, less on a discounted price for the acreage over two. Over two acres. That does not qualify for 61A. Sorry, let me rephrase that. That may qualify for 61A B or, uh, or 61B or 61, but the owner has chosen not to put it under those chapter nines. And at the moment, it is not buildable until the plans are one thing or another found on it. At that point, we would consider it completely taxable land. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Hayden. I wanted to express jealousy of my colleague, uh, Mr. Wald. Last year, when we uh, got this presentation, we didn't have all of these wonderful presentations. These are very helpful, and I do appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and I, I, I know that he can't because he didn't uh, slog through the hour-long presentation <laughs> we had last year when he asked all the questions and tried to figure this out. So, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kelly, did you have your hand? Oh, uh, yeah. What was the new growth that the state certified? $473,000. What's that as a percentage? Percentage of? Uh, like 2.5%. Uh, two and a half percent is nine hundred and sixty five thousand, so new growth is one and a quarter percent. That's uh, down considerably from our heyday of about a million dollars. Yeah. Other questions or comments? You're welcome. All right. So uh so we do this every year. I think this is the this is like the sixth one of these I've sat through from even before I was on select board. And the issues are exactly the same every single year. I'm looking at the notes that I brought to the 2008 discussion, just because I happen to have those. Um, so the split tax rate, it comes down to, um, because of the distribution of the residential and commercial property, it is such a small benefit to each resident and such a huge increase to each commercial property um, that every year it's been decided to be not worth it. Um, and also that that discourages business when we're always trying to encourage business. So nothing about that has changed. Residential exemption, um, that while it sounds good, it is, uh, it's untargeted. Uh, it, let's see, there are a range of income and need levels across all property values. Another issue is the rental properties are about 60% of our housing units are ineligible for the exemption so it shifts the burden to them so the rental folks who you think are the typically the lower income folks um, bear a bigger proportion of the the property tax situation um, because of course it gets passed on to them um, that that is something that works well in vacation communities when you have second home owners but that's not the situation we're in this year um, and that if we were to give it a try which is sometimes um, put out there as a possibility, there would be such a big change that it would make it very difficult to switch back because that would mean for um, the folks who had their property taxes lowered under that change, it would make for a very big increase uh, if we were to switch back. Small commercial exemption, as Mr. Burgess noted, um, there's just no, nobody who qualifies for that in Amherst people, typically small business owners of very small businesses don't also own their properties and the open space thing, we've talked about that plenty. Um, so nothing changes, the recommendations are the same every year, um, and does anybody have any reason to want to make a decision other than the same decision we make every year? Okay, um, so let me just ask then, the, the, one, the one reason, the, the one area that's always a concern, of course, is um, the fact that we have such a high student rental population. Um, first of all, um, Tell us how those are, I know the answer to this because I asked the question every year, but tell us how the, uh, the properties are assessed, whether they're assessed as residential or commercial. Um, oh, the apartments? The, for, yeah, apartments and, um, and single family houses that are rentals. They're, they're all classed as residential based on their use. Massachusetts, if the property's owned, uh, if the property's occupied for residential use, Except in the case of hotels, it is residential. The same with um, rooming houses and um, inns. They're all residential. Hotels are commercial, but the, the others are 
residential. And so the reason that's interesting is uh, obviously we have the same tax rate, so you say who cares? But um, but it's a question of how you then determine the um, valuations on them. So uh, a commercial property is is determined by not its um, not its comps and its sales the way houses are, but about the uh, the income that it brings in. Right. Commercial and uh, multifamily residential properties, not single-family residentials. They are based on the market still because we have enough sales of single-family residentials to, to do that. We really don't have any sort of a commercial market or a um, <clears throat> multifamily residential market. So we have to use what we call the income, uh, income approach to valuation. In Massachusetts, we're allowed to use three valuations, cost, market, which is obviously the market, and income. Uh, with being no market, we have to compare the cost of what the property would cost to build, replace, and the income. We always have to use two values. Uh, the income approach to the value is quite simply, uh, we go out and we send letters to everyone in town, and we did this year, who has a commercial property or a multifamily residence. And by multifamily residence, I mean more than four units, three units or still uh, under the market value. They return the income value to uh, the forms to us. This year, when they did it, we had an 82% return from the commercial properties and a 78% return from the com uh, residential properties. That, in part, is because the law has changed. We are now able to put an, a, a penalty on the people that did not return uh, their forms to us and they will lose their right to appeal to the appellate tax board. There's no longer shall, they will lose the right to appeal. So that has helped us get this, these forms back. What we do is when we get the forms back, we look at the income that's generated, the total gross potential income, which is all the property's valuation from rents, and any miscellaneous income from such things as they might have for parking spaces and or uh, um, laundry rooms in the property, any, of the, any income that comes into the property from the property. Uh, we also look at any expenses they will have, such as uh, snow plowing, electricity, utilities that are paid by the owners of the property, insurance, of course, which is a big one, and uh, any capital expenses they may have for roofing or repairs that have to be made. Uh, so we take the gross income, we find out what their vacancy is for the year. All the properties tell us how much the gross income is and what their net income was, so the difference is the vacancy rate. We apply the vacancy rate, which is about 5% in our case, to the gross income, so it's reduced by 5%. We take away the allowable, allowable expenses from that figure, and that leaves us with a net income, net operating income. and the, and the Formula is the same for both residential and commercial. And then we apply what is called a capitalization rate, which in a short means that uh, it's what the figure we use that gives you a, a return on the investment that people use. And the capitalization rate will be made up of the interest rate or mortgage rate that they may have on average that we calculate, uh, the tax rate, and a, a certain amount of time for depreciation factor. Uh, usually in a 40-year life, 2.5% two two of the property is in the tax rate. We divide the net operating income by that figure, and that gives us a mark, uh, an income valuation to the property. And we compare that to our cost, or we estimate the cost to be. And to satisfy the Department of Revenue, we have to be within 10% of that value. We create various tables for various types of property. There could be... Uh, um, Apartments, there would be, uh, uh, <laughs> can't read my own writing, professional properties, medical pro uh, buildings, ho uh, hotels, retail, office, and other types of gas stations. We would put all, the, they'd all get their own different table applied to them and, uh, based on the number of units, square footage, or whatever the uh, unit may be that we choose to use. And then we generate the income from that because we don't have a market, and that's the only reason we do it.
And so do you have any means of verifying that information? So, for example, for the multifamily properties, four or more units, um, can you check the rents that are being, you know, advertised or whatever? Yeah, we do check the rents that are being advertised. We have in the past talked with the university uh, housing people who have lists of, uh, of available rentals. And, of course, the bigger, like the Boulders or North, South, Park, South Point, they're always in the paper. So we get an idea in those Colonial Village or uh, Puffton. They're all easy. And same with uh, downtown businesses. Are you able to check the rents or verify them in some way? Very few of those come on the paper, uh, books, but we can ver uh, look at them as best we can when we see them on the, uh, paper, on the newspapers. And that's, we do look at the listings that the realtors have as well. We're quite active in the, using their web page. Good, good. As um, the select board always gets the leases the, um, as part of new uh, liquor licenses, we end up with the full lease that uh, uh, that a business has with the um, property owner. And so it's interesting to me to think about the information that we get that way, that's, mm -hmm. that's the actual agreement between the tenant and the property owner and what the property owner is reporting to the town. I'm not sure if I can use that legally. I would have to check. I've never never heard of anyone using that, but it would be a good it would be a good source. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions or comments, Mr. Stein. Uh, I may have missed this, but do we have any idea what percentage of our rentals are by students? Does anyone have any I, idea? I don't know. Okay, just curious, because. Given the extra costs that are being incurred by some of these students, I'd almost vote for a differential tax rate for that. It's very difficult because obviously, know. you know, there is there are a lot of low-income families sure. that are part of that, exactly. and you'd really need to know very specifically, and and you'd almost need a, a way to offset exactly. the um, the extra burden that you were putting on those folks. So that's something that the select board struggles with every year that concept right. you know is there a way to get a little bit more from these properties that are in fact costing us more um, in some ways that is made up for in the market value of the uh, the properties themselves so anything that is just a single family home um, the its rental potential is included in its market value and those do turn over uh, a fair amount and in fact a lot of them have been bought lately but all of our housing prices are dependent in part on what our potential rental value is so that is kind of captured in some way with single family houses but um but a lot less so in in other situations so it's complicated miss brewer I know we didn't want to get into a big long presentation and I may just be confused and need to ask you about this offline. But one of the one of the things we were talking about here as we were discussing how we do the uh, commercial because of course things don't turn over the way they do um, with individual single family residences, thinking about actual single family residences with single families in them as opposed to those who are rented out. Um, when you mentioned the return rate on the questionnaires, you mentioned 78% residential and 82% commercial. When you say residential in that context, are we talking about a couple of different things that are called residential? Because I'm getting confused because we're not asking single family homeowners to return no. any of this information. So you're talking about like a Bart's ice cream versus a place that you know has six rental apartments in it. And That's I think, what we mean by residential versus commercial in this context. And when I'm talking about residential and commercial, I'm talking about anything over four families. Right. That's, right. But you know. over four families, meaning there were residential questionnaires and there were commercial questionnaires, yes. but they're all within kind of the business side of things because they're more than four units, yes. four units or more. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Wald. I believe Mr. Bridges also made reference to the vacancy rate, which I know can mean different things in different contexts, but could you say just a few words about that? There's been so much talk about housing in town recently and also with regard to certain measures that came before town meeting and we have this proposed housing study to analyze the housing stock and needs. Just explain what, what that means in, in your line of work. Well, the vacancy, the vacancy can have a different meaning because we have so many seasonal rentals. We, you know, two to three months of the year we could rely on some properties being vacant, which is unusual. Normally what you'd be talking about from a vacancy is when, a, a, a <clears throat> when somebody actually has a vacancy that they're actively trying to fill 
A lot of our uh, apartment complexes, right? I'm not talking commercial at the moment. I'm only talking apartment complexes at the moment. That they are only, they're not actively trying to fill them for those two or three months unless the people have got a year's lease and they might get a sublease on that. They themselves are then trying to do it. So we're counting that vacancy as about 5% at the moment overall. If we took the three months, it would be 25%, and that's just not realistic. Is there any way to compare that with other communities or, or regions or broader uh, averages? Yeah, uh, yes, it would, it would be possible to compare it. I mean, the assessors are always willing to share information with each other, so we could find that out. Uh, it be easy to find out from Northampton, which is probably the biggest and closest to us. Thank you. Okay. Other questions or comments? Other questions or comments from the public? All right, then this public hearing shall close at 7.30 p.m. And we need to vote to close the public hearing. Second. In favor, aye. Aye. Thank you. Aye. 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 Unanimous. Close the public hearing at 7.30, and now it's time to deliberate. So, Ms. Stein, would you like to make the motions on the tax rate? Sure. Can be I move discussion. that the select board accept a minimum residential factor of one equal tax rate for all classes of properties for fiscal year 2012 and that no open space discount be granted. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Aye, aye. that's unanimous. Next. I move that the select board not adopt a residential exemption for fiscal year 2012. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. I move that the select board not adopt a small commercial exemption for fiscal year 2012. Second. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Unanimous. Once again, we've accepted all of your excellent recommendations and we very much appreciate all of the information. You, you continue to really um, kind of customize to the questions that, that come up and, and trying to provide more information to us and to the community, which is very much appreciated. Ms. Brewer, before they leave. And just to reiterate the, the figure that appears in here over and over again, but people always like to be sure and they know is the, the rate is now 1963 because we don't Five. actually Five. vote on that. Yep. 1965 Exactly, because exactly, we yep. needed to correct all the... Uh, Mr. Musanti has a form that I need you to sign uh, so I can forward to the Department of Revenue and I can just pick it up tomorrow morning. Okay. Just wanted to remind him. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Board of Assessors and everyone for all your hard work on that and for all your good information. All right. 7.32, our next item is the 7.30 item, which is consider an updated complete streets proposal. Yeah. And we have various folks here to talk about this with us. It's a good point. We have in our packets um, and one updated inf piece of information on our desks um, a bunch of um, statements regarding the complete streets um, support, primarily support. Um, and we have the updated proposal itself. Some months ago, I meant to check exactly when it was, I can't remember when it was, um, Mr. Crowner came before us uh, with a proposal and we said, okay, yeah, we gotta keep thinking about it, gotta tweak it, it's gotta go to the other committees, et cetera. Um, and we now have a new updated proposal. So um, Mr. Crowner, Rob Crowner is here to talk to us about this. And um, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you for the information you provided. And why don't you start by telling us what's different about this proposal than the last time we saw it. Okay. Um, so. I'm Rob Crowner. I'm representing the Complete Streets uh, Task Force of, of the Public Transportation and Bicycle Committee, um, and that's that's the subcommittee that that is bringing this proposal forward. Um, so, what we found when we went out and, and talked with other committees and, and talked with people is is how important streets are to everyone for a variety of reasons. Um, um, it's the way that that people get from one place to another, however they go, whether it's by car or or walking or whatever. You're going to be on the street in some form. Um, it's also um, it, it's also where we we have some control over over our tree canopy. We have trees in the in the right of way, and that's an, an important part of of what the streets are about. Um, another thing that you may remember from a month ago is is uh, village centers. When we when we were um, 
creating zoning for, for village centers, we're really looking at, at the way the public and the private realm come together at the street. And that's, and that's where the basis of form-based form code starts. It starts at the street and works back. And so, so streets are very important. They're more, they're, they're more important than just a place for cars to go. And so that's what this proposal is about. One of the th we've, we tweaked um, the proposal in several ways, primarily by adding language that, that specifically addressed trees um, and um, specifically addressed uh, um, disability access committee's um, concerns. And we also put uh, some language in there that, that explicitly um, recognizes that the select board is, is the keeper of the public way. So, so those things were, were missing that uh, the other committees told us about, brought us to our attention, and, and so that's what we're returning to you, an updated version. Okay. And uh, let's see, other, other overview stuff that you'd like to uh, mention for folks at home who maybe haven't read the document yet? Sure. The, the, what we're asking for is, is for the town to adopt the policy that, um, that, that we take a complete streets approach to our, to our road network. And that means that um, when we're designing a street, when we're um, um, planning how, how to repave a street or, or what a street is going to do, we're looking at it holistically and not just um, um, looking to, to fill up the potholes and, and smooth it out. We're looking at how do, I, how do people use it? Um, what can we do with the street? Is there an opportunity to, to put some trees in there? Is, there, is, there, is it heavily used by um, pedestrians or, or bicyclists and, and in need of infrastructure to accommodate those people? Um, so this so this policy says, if you adopt it, it would say, yes, we want we want the town to to look at streets um, in a complete way, to attempt to design and and manage our streets in a complete way. And it, it offers um, um, some questions that 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 would help guide a decision or or, or guide a thought process on on how how to evaluate a street. Um, it calls for um, it calls for the town to develop a plan about what streets should be complete, how they should be how they should be completed, um, and and for um, we we assume that 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 would be part of the transportation master plan, um, and and that going forward when a street. When the when the road repair schedule is is presented to you, that that um, the Department of Public Works and and the various committees will have have evaluated the proposal um, from all of those perspectives, and and present you a a plan that that takes that into account. It doesn't necessarily mean that that they'll be able to to accomplish everything that that we want them to accomplish, but at least an attempt will be made to 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 look at it in that way. Thank you. So uh, this information, as well as uh, everything we talk about here, is uh, on the select board's web packet, so folks can read this at home. Um, questions or comments about the policy as proposed from select board members currently? No. Okay. Um, so I have some questions and some comments. The um, it talks about in the opening paragraph that. Um, it references at the end of the first paragraph, uh, through the application of complete street design principles. And those aren't referenced anywhere within the document. Is that referring to anything in particular outside of the document, or is that something that would be created in the future? What, where are those principles um, outlined? Okay, uh, um, the answer is actually both. Um, there, there are, complete streets is a term of art for, for um, pub public works um, professional. Um, and also for planning professionals, it's 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 well known what what that means. Now, um, so so you could refer to any number of, of books or, or websites, or whatever uh, manuals that 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 would describe what what complete streets are. So so um, you could interpret it in that way. You could also in 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 our, in our last paragraph, I, I believe it is, um, we suggest that perhaps the town could develop its own complete complete streets um, standards. So, so based on, on national um, 
recommendations or or whatever that it wouldn't necessarily have to be a part of of the policy or the plan um, but it could be um, the, the key is that that um, complete streets standards exist or um, the principles exist and and they can be followed either at the macro level or or the town could develop its own okay um Let's see. Some look at my various notes. Most of them are are uh, word related. Um, okay. So the the part about uh, clear process for granting exceptions shall include review and approval by appropriate town officials. This is uh, towards the end of the second page. Uh, town officials and relevant boards and committees with final authority resting. Uh, in the select board. The reasons for an exemption shall be documented and noted in the public record. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm totally in favor of this concept. What my only concern is that I'm, I'm wondering, and that's kind of about my first question about complete streets, is how rigidly we're locking something into this. So the idea of an exception um, and whether the, whether the policy would be waived, um, it, it just seems a little bit strict to me when the, when the concept is something that we're clearly trying to implement anyway and i just don't want to make the idea of um of uh making exceptions to it too cumbersome um so i'm just a little bit worried kind of process wise how would you envision maybe you could just talk about what how an exception would would work and what a waiver would be like and and just sure. what you're thinking about there um the remember that the the, the reason that 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 we started this initiative is because the, the the bond authorization or the bond request that came to town meeting last fall specifically said this is for paving streets and nothing else um, and and we think that's the wrong approach the approach that we would like to have is that we're going to pave the streets and and while we're paving the street we're going to also look at these other things that might need to be done so, so all it means is that when, when the proposal is brought forward, when, when Mr. Mooring brings the, the street plan to you, he's going to say, um, this, these are the streets that I want to pave, and these are the additional th things that, that should be done and can be done in, in the scope of the project, you know, in, with the limitations that, that I have, budget, um, topography, you know, all these things. Um, you know the whole the whole package is before you and and he will say I, I imagine envision that this would be what, the way it would work he would say I, I would like to put sidewalks on this street but I cannot do it so rather than just say this is the street I'm gonna pave it and not say anything about sidewalks I want I want the, the I want you to expect that he will say this is the entire project that I'm doing and this is what I'm. This is what I'm not doing. This is what I am doing, and 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 so that's what you're. That's what I would like you to approve, rather than just the streets that were that are going to be paved. So so I I, I would expect that that um, you would develop a, a protocol or an expectation that 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 is what is is being brought forward, and and so those are the reasons why you would be why. Mr. Waring or, or whoever would would say I, I can't do this. Um, not that not that you're going to um, second guess what what he's doing unless you want to, um, but that that it was thought beforehand. Okay, so it says a clear process for granting exceptions shall include review and approval by appropriate town officials and relevant boards and committees with final authority resting with select board, or whatever. Right. Um, so I'm just I'm a little bit concerned about the idea that like you know it doesn't have. A particular street can't have a bus shelter added, and you know, public transportation committee objects to the fact that it doesn't. Have it. So they're they're saying, you know, you can't make that exception or whatever, and it can't be made. But I guess if it's ultimately coming to the select board, we say, yeah, sorry, we know you wanted a bus shelter, but you know, it can't happen. Or you say, no, we really want to have a bus shelter also, or something. So it's not it's not that anybody has veto power along the way. It's just that it's it's a feedback mechanism. Exactly right. What the the way. Um, major road projects happen now, or at least I, I believe they happen now, is that there is a public hearing process 
just uh, it, it's similar to the way the state runs its its hearing process. So all those committees should be, you know, should be informed of, of when the hearing is, and and be able to check in and and make the recommendations at those 25 percent, 75 percent hearings. And so that's that's when it will be vetted, hopefully. And yeah, they might they might say, you know, we regret that 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 there's not what we want here. Our recommendation is this, but. Um, you know, if Mr. Mooring is not able to, to accommodate that, then, then he can't. Um, and to your point earlier about the, the road bond before saying, you know, this is for paving, um, but nothing else. Um, in fact, because of this whole discussion, because of your coming to right. select board, because this discussion is happening in other places, that road bond did um, improve in the complete streets manner. A lot of those streets that got um, repaved, uh, Meadow Street, uh, Amity Street, various places had bike lanes added and, and bus shelters where that was possible. Right. So, um, and so, the speed tables on, on McClellan, which we appreciate. Right. Much, yeah. So I like to think that this is kind of working to um, to formalize and codify the fact that this is kind of the ethos of the town right now. Yes. Um, but what I don't want to do is put something in writing that ties our hands. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like we don't want to have unintended consequences of a really well-intentioned policy. So we have to just kind of be troubleshooting it for the future and not just saying, yeah, yeah, this expresses everything that, that we like. Um, Ms. Brewer. I'm wondering, and, and I don't want, I, I want to simplify, I don't want to oversimplify all the hard work that's gone into this, but I wonder if we're at the point where we would feel comfortable with the checklist. I know that's something we seem to have an aversion to at some levels um, in town hall and amongst volunteer committees, but something that would basically cover these things much in the way that we eventually developed, thanks to our now town manager, um, a way of looking at our capital projects within a framework of questions, whereas before it had always been kind of how they always did it before, as opposed to something laid out that basically anybody could look at and have an understanding of what categories things fell under. And so Mr. Morin could attach to a project, you know, the first 10 things are checked off and the other three things says, you know, cost is too great, this is this problem, this that. What I, I understand, I think, what you're saying about not making the process too cumbersome. I also don't want just a long verbal report telling me why we can't do certain things because that's just out the window until we go back and watch the tape and one of us understands it one way and one of us understands it another way and that just seems like a lot of effort on everybody's part. But I, in terms of trying to make relatively little effort associated with this since we've already seemed to have a lot of buy-in from everyone including Mr. Mooring Public Works Department as to how we want to approach these things. In terms of just showing that, I wonder if maybe the town manager would be interested in addressing the idea of something like a checklist that we could just all see and then it would you know, it would go up on our website so everybody would see, okay, these are the things that, that were agreed upon, that are proposed, these are the things that are not covered in this particular one. Oh, well, that's too bad, or oh, well, I have to really go and talk about that to somebody. Um, without it becoming a really long report every time somebody wants to. I mean, we don't do these every day, but at the same time, I don't want to have to write extra pages of text for a particular report either. Um, so I'll note, I'll let Mr. Musanti respond, but I'll just note that um, with the section that's called design guidelines in here, which I'm not sure that's the right term, but um, I, I think that's kind of doing a lot of what you're talking mm -hmm. about. And to me, that reminded me of, um, is it section 10.38 or something in the, um, in the zoning bylaw that, that's mm. the the order of conditions that for special permits and for site plan ah. reviews that you're sort of saying you know these are the these are the criteria that have to be considered and met right. so i think that that's that's largely doing um kind of what you're talking about but Ms. Musi yeah i think the uh, the guidebook checklist concept that you're talking about is one of the products envisioned uh, as part of the transportation uh, master plan update that town meeting uh, supported I think last spring uh, the funding for that and so we have a an ad hoc committee of committee members from uh, public transportation and bicycle committee planning board uh, public works committee uh, and others and part of that will be a street by street inventory of, of, of design elements that the town should actively consider next time the road is being renovated or reconstructed so it would not be a that would, uh, as we're at the beginning of the design process uh, or planning process for road uh, uh, improvements in the future, you'd have this guidebook 
uh, as opposed to it being a more ad hoc process. So that's looking at things very street by street, um, kind of as opposed to this design guidelines checklist type thing that Ms. Brewer is talking about. Um, Mr. Crowner, maybe you could talk about that implementation section because that really is what, what our understanding is of the transportation master plan. So there's this group that's going to create the same thing that was like the, um, the pavement improvement plan from a couple years ago, but that, that you're saying these, these other folks would weigh in on how do you see that interacting with the transportation master plan task force situation because we, we think that's about to happen. Um, I, I think exactly what Mr. Miosanti said. I think that is that is the transportation master plan is the implementation of of, of the policy. But you have to have the policy. I mean, the, the policy is, is is a statement by the town that, that this is important to us, and so that that's what that's what this is about. Okay. So the implementation paragraph at the uh, at the end. It says a complete streets implementation plan shall be developed by the public transportation. Bicycle committees, blah 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 blah. That's right, really I, what's going to be created by this transportation. Yeah, I, I understood the 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 request or whatever by, for the for funding for the transportation master plan came out of the public transportation bicycle committee. So I think that's that's why we're referencing it that it, like that. I mean, I guess it could be done some other way, but okay. So um, so at least in the wording, I think that it would need some incorporation of the concept of what's about to happen. Sure. That, yeah. Um, about that. Other questions or comments, Selectman? Mr. Hayden? Yeah, I just, just, just uh, sort of in, in wrestling with this, it's, it's very interesting. One of the first things that I did when I joined this august body was to talk about um, coordinating um, road projects between the various groups that need to talk about road projects, the very same groups that are mentioned here uh, with the addition of the Public Shade Tree Committee, um, uh, Disability Access, um, Advisory Committee and the Public Works and um, and others as needed. That was sort of a nascent concept that you know none of this happens in a vacuum. Um, and this this so this is seems feels like a culmination of that. It seems like sort of that that effort rolling along. We talk about checklists, we talk about all kinds of things. But I was just trying to sort of get my hands about what what this is doing and really what it's asking us to do. Um, is um, well, first of all, you know, ask the Public Transportation Bicycle Committee to come up with this this great plan. But that great plan does <coughs> asks, in essence, it asks ten questions of any piece of street, and it applies to each one of those ten questions three tests. You know, um, is it local context test and the appropriate test and the reasonable effort text, uh, test, and then it applies to those thirty combinations for possible exemptions, um, which all kind of sounds like a normal thing to do for any roadway project. Um, so the question really, I guess, to us is um, whether this is the way to implement that kind of series of tests, screening, um, design criteria. Um, in fact, you know, when, when I think about the roads that we've seen that have been, uh, whose design we appreciate, this is exactly what's happened. I'm thinking of the, the rotary at UMass, for instance. I'm sorry, it's a roundabout uh, at UMass. Um, so other little you know, pieces of the project on Meadow Street, uh, as a, for instance. So that's, that's what I'm feeling like we're wrestling with right now. Other questions or comments? OK. Um, so I have just, just little thoughts about um, a little bit of wording, a little bit of prioritization. Um, I really like the concept, um, and I appreciate what you're saying about you know you have a you have a, a policy that helps to guide the implementation, and I like the idea of this helping to guide what the uh, uh, expressing the town's values to help guide what the transportation task force is going to then create. Um, and I know that when you were here last time. I specifically said if people had feedback for you for any changes, they should get it to you so you didn't come back and have us give you more feedback on changes. And I don't know if I wasn't paying enough attention last time or, uh, <laughs> or if you changed it significantly, but, um, but I would like to give a little bit more feedback on changes to you. And I also want to express great appreciation for how open you and all the committees have been to all of this um, all of this, the changes and feedback and, and incorporating all of the um, 
uh, the uh, priorities of uh, things like Disability Access Advisory Committee, Public Shade Tree Committee, which is kind of outside what some folks might think of as, as part of the general realm of what you're talking about when you're talking about complete streets, because a lot of times people are thinking, you know, bicycling and pedestrians, but it's it's a lot more than that. So, um, so I think it's wonderful that you've been so thorough with this. Um, so I, I think I, and I apologize terribly, would like to offer some tweak suggestions, not here, but um, in email, see what you think of those. And, um, and then, uh, and then I, I think that this is very approvable, um, and I would like us to make a statement of support of the concept again. Um, Mr. Musanti, how do you see a, a policy statement like this um, helping or hurting what you're envisioning for the plan of the, of the transportation, um, wh which we call what? Task force? Task force. Um, I think we are in sync conceptually, you know, uh, there may be some concerns about some of the details about process, but um, I think we're in sync. Um, um, and that was manifested, at least in a, in a limited way, through the pavement uh, improvement bond uh, for some pretty major roads in town, Meadow, Amity. Uh, next year, Lower Main Street with uh, Community Development Block Grant Monday m money has uh, um, barrier removal and uh, sidewalk improvements and things like that incorporated into the design. Um, so I think, I think we're getting close. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's, it's ready just yet for policy approval. Um, okay, so I, I think it's not 100% ready for policy approval either, but um, as far as the policy interacting with kind of that implementation part, like I like the idea of having a policy that helps to guide that, but I don't want to also be tying the hands of a group that is about to do a ton of of analysis of street by street what everything needs. I don't think it necessarily would do that, but if, but I'm wondering if you have any concerns about it doing that. I, I think the policy can exist before that happens. Um, what do you I, think? I, I don't disagree with that, and uh, you know that work of that master planning group for the transportation will be you know many months in length. So, okay, not incompatible. So, um, Ms. Burr. You're probably already going this direction, but I have a question associated with it too. Um, so I'm kind of seeing this as, I uh, don't like that V vision word, but I'm kind of seeing this as, as part of the preamble or introduction or whatever of this transportation master plan that'll be worked on. And because this is just so core critical to, to what we're talking about doing and, and sets it up nicely in terms of, of, of a big cohesive um, effort. What I am concerned about, though, is actually the body that's going to be doing the work. And if I understand it correctly, we're talking about hiring a consultant, and we're talking about sort of a, a, a task force that's a committee of representatives, different committees. Are they going to be subject to open meeting law, et cetera, because uh, we need to make sure that happens. I'm, if it was a one-two thing because you were meeting to pick a consultant, but I'm feeling like this is a public process, so where does this fit? My understanding is they would be subject to open meeting law. Okay. I hope they, uh, and, and they will become aware of that because this isn't something that's being appointed through the select board. It's being, it's, it's one of yours. Yes. <laughs> um, it, it's not something that's on our list is what I'm saying. And so um, as, long, as long as they are aware and have been directed and that they that, will need to post meetings, et cetera. Have they started yet? Has anybody missed anything? I think is part of the question here, too. <laughs> Where are they? Uh, they've met uh, a couple of times so far. Okay. I, I just know that based on our past experience, sometimes people don't realize that if they haven't seen a charge and a book and they, they're just meeting, they don't realize that, yes, they still have to follow all those same rules. and although they might seem a bit cumbersome. Once you get used to them, they're not too bad. And that would give the public an opportunity, if they were particularly concerned, to talk then, rather than to come to us when it's all finished and say, why didn't you think about this? Okay. And bearing in mind that this is made up of representatives from all these different committees who would presumably well, be talking about it at their meetings and stuff be also. Discussing it all the way along. Because as you said, it would be a several month process. This isn't like a two meeting deal. So. 
Okay. Thank so, you. Um, so would you mind terribly if we tweak the language a tiny bit more, and then you know I'll be in touch with you about that. If anybody, maybe nobody else has any tweaks, but um, we'll kind of see where you are with it, and uh, and then we'll we'll take the final step. I hope at approving the policy. Okay. Is that good. Um, anybody else want to say anything about this one here, Mr. Snow, and then Mr. Zomak. Hi, Alan Welcome. Snow, Tree Warden. Um, so I just uh, want to give my two cents on the complete street concept. Um, I'm all for the movement of, of people and uh, merchandise and uh, whatnot across our roads uh, in a very environmentally friendly manner. And what I'd like to do is, is um, take it a step further, actually, and really make it a complete street. Um, and include the Green Street concept. Um, if we're going to go forward with a, with a process to look at our streets in a way uh, to make them better, um, let's really get serious about including the green infrastructure with the gray infrastructure uh, so that we could capitalize on stormwater cleaning and filtering at the source. Uh, we can improve uh, more trees along our streets in the appropriate areas. Um, improve the neighborhood, uh, home values, business values. Um, a, a complete street should include the green infrastructure as well as the gray infrastructure. And going forward, I'd just like everyone to keep that in mind if possible um, as we do that. Um, is that a specific concept that you've talked with Mr. Crowner and others about? We've, it was mentioned um, at the shade tree meetings in the, in the past. And, and do you think that as written, this, this doesn't address that sufficiently or it does? It, it, well, this is, again, this is just a concept. So um, I would like it as um, equally balanced um, moving forward in the concept uh, stage so that it's, it's weighted equally uh, where appropriate. Okay. Um, the um, you know, Mentor Street was a project that was just finished, which is pretty close to being a complete street. Um, it is a sharp contrast to what it used to be as a street, and it really has a different feel to it now than it did before. And so if we could capitalize on that green infrastructure concept as we were doing these projects, um, I think we could reduce that kind of shock as we change to a more complete street approach. We have scenic roads, um, and I think that's addressed in the complete street um, literature. Now, not every road needs to look exactly the same, and, and we just need to keep that in mind. So. Thank you. Mr. Zomek? I just happened to be here for another article and uh, heard another uh, issue, so I thought I would, uh, and I apologize to Mr. Cron. I was a little busy earlier this fall, so I might have missed some of the public process um, that went into this, but um, I had a couple of, of comments. One is in quickly reading through the policy, um, Echoing a little bit of what um, uh, Mr. Snow said, um, it does seem like the the references to natural resources, historic resources, and scenic resources are are a little bit light in this document itself. I, I know that there's f deeper um, um, background uh, uh, materials on complete streets, but um, I don't see scenic resources referenced anywhere in the document, and, and that would be a little bit concerning to me. Um, you know, more thinking more broadly about some of the impacts to things like potential impacts to APRs, conservation land, wetlands, I, I realize that'll all be taken uh, in account through uh, a matrix and through a series of um, uh, decisions and, and the transportation plan itself as you assess various streets, presumably all that will be taken into consideration, but it it gets very complicated. I think we just need to juxtapose Meadow Street, for instance, with Pine Street, and you have a much different layout of, of land, public land, natural resources uh, on the eastern section if on Pine Street versus, for instance, on uh, Meadow Street. Um, and again, I apologize because I haven't been that involved, but um, I, I wondered if Mr. Croner could tell us 
Um, has this gone before the planning board and, and gotten input from the CONCOM and say the Agricultural Commission? Because I would think those three bodies would want to give feedback and and again, I was acting town manager and, and I was a little preoccupied with those duties and haven't been uh, in touch with, with this process very closely. So I apologize if that has already happened. Okay. Mr. Crowner, you want to speak to planning board, AGCOM, CONCOM, and whether or not they have or will provide an input? Um, we, we did not take it to the planning board or to the Conservation Commission. Um, Agricultural Commission, they, they, I think that's, I appreciate the comments and I think, I think I agree with them. They're, they're, they, those are all, um, like I said at the beginning, everyone is invested in the streets. So, 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 you know, I guess we could take this to every committee and ask for feedback. Um, um, we're, but, but then, that's that's sort of getting to um, rewriting the master plan or or, or reevaluating them, you know, taking another look at the master plan, which you know is is reasonable. I mean, we, all the things, all of our decisions are, are guided by the master plan. Recently, we we all we think about you know what did the master plan say about that when we when we when we look at any kind of proposal. So I think that's it's not unreasonable to to think that 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 these other boards might have something to say about it. I don't think that, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that, that the plan um, uh, ignores those committees. It just, it just doesn't mention them, or, or it doesn't uh, ignore their concerns. It just doesn't mention them, I think. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's implied, but, but maybe it does need to be more explicit. I don't know. So, so maybe you can think a little bit more about uh, whether or not to bring it to them, and maybe um, obviously you are part of one of those, and uh, and Mr. Zomek helps with two of those. Um, can can see if those uh, bodies would like to weigh in on this concept. Um, so, okay, all right. Um, so I, I can appreciate that uh, Mr. Crowner and other members of the. Um, subcommittee who have been working on this for so long might be a little bit frustrated and you certainly come up and speak um, but I'll just say that um, this is this this process is it's like all good you know so we uh, you know we keep talking about these things and even by having the discussion again it kind of keeps adding to um, informing any project that's going forward and so even though we haven't gotten to something that we're you know finally approving at this point it still is adding to the conversation and um, and um, just making this this part of what we do in Amherst so this is all valuable even though we we're not coming out of here tonight with a policy but yes please um, as far as the task force that you had, I forget your last name. I apologize. I, you could um, identify yourself. Lynn Grabowski. I'm Grabowski, with the Public Transportation Advisory Committee and with the subcommittee with Rob Crowner for the Complete Streets. When you mentioned the task force, which is supposed to be two members of the Public Works Committee, the Public Transportation Committee, is it the, I forget what other committee, but to my, I was one of the volunteers from the Transportation Committee along with another member to be part of that task force, and to my knowledge, there have been no meetings. We haven't been informed the last time. We brought it up with Mr. Mooring. Um, it was supposed to start in August, but that it hadn't yet started. So I think this is a point to be made of implementation of the complete streets policy is that all of these committees need to work together towards the same goal of the master plan. And the guidelines exist in many different places already with the DOT, whether they call it green dot or the newest incarnation that they use for new construction at least. If there is a bridge built, say there has to be accommodations for bicycles and pedestrians. So not to repeat all that, but just hearing that about the task force lets me know that there are some loose ends that need to be tied up in that. I think that the checklist is a good idea, that like all of the committees could go over the checklist and say, are we accommodating all of the users for our streets, whether it's, you know, pedestrian, a cyclist, um, you know, ADA compliance for wheelchairs, just everyone included, and that Mr. Zomek would bring up the, you know, concoms and cultural aspects. I think that would all be included also. So I think implementation, a checklist would be good in that all of these committees need to work together towards the same goal. 
Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so we'll keep plugging away at this and hopefully the next time or soon thereafter that we see this, we will be ready to, uh, to all approve it. But uh, thank you again for bringing it in. It, it does, it, it helps to, to bring it here and kind of publicize the discussion so that we have all these other ideas that go along with it. So again, thank you very much for your work on this and uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. All right, what do we got next? Is okay? Yes, Ms. Burr. Um, since you're working on these comments that you're planning to send along, if you would clarify in the comments, and, and it sounds like you probably were going to anyway, under the implementation section, what this policy is used for. So it, the policy is there for, you know, we have this little pretend policy book, imaginary someday policy book, but that it doesn't just sit in there, that it's part then of this transportation master plan. I think that would be helpful so people know, well, what does that mean? So you said all these really great things, but what do you do with it now? Okay. Thanks. All right, next up we have town manager's report. Mr. Misanti. Thank you. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about a couple of parking-related uh, issues uh, that occurred subsequent to your last meeting, uh, but needed action uh, prior to tonight. So in keeping with our policy, the board's policy about uh, parking uh, approvals, uh, I wanted to bring two of those to your attention. One, uh, I approved uh, Thanksgiving week, Monday through Thursday, uh, the uh, bagging of three meters uh, directly in front of the Starbucks uh, store on North Pleasant Street to accommodate the uh, renovation work that was undertaken at that location and that required uh, three spaces to be taken out of service for four business days, and I wanted to make, bring that to your attention. Uh, the second item was related to the Mary Maple celebration uh, downtown last Friday, uh, December 2nd. Uh, your vote at your last meeting was for, uh, to allow uh, sleigh rides uh, by Mr. Roberts along North Pleasant Street. Uh, he came to, uh, contacted the town manager's office subsequent to that suggesting that uh, revi revision of plans to do the sleigh rides uh, within the Spring Street parking lot. And uh, I gave them permission to do that. So they were not on North Pleasant, but they were in the uh, Spring Street lot. And Spring Street, like I think they went all the way down to the Amherst College lot and turned around. Thank yes, and right, between uh, uh, Boltwood and Churchill. Uh, next, uh, uh, Lord Jeffrey in update. Uh, that project is uh, nearing completion. Uh, it's been a tremendous uh, uh, investment of time and money on the part of Amherst College. Um, and they're in the home stretch. Uh, they are in the midst of gaining final approvals uh, from our local building and health uh, departments related to the various inspectional permits. Uh, there was another meeting today uh, related to this project with Amherst College representatives, and uh, they're looking to secure final approvals on the, on, the, on the inspection side, permit side, in the next 10 days or so, and that both the inn and the restaurant are aiming to open to the public on January 5th. Uh, the website is up and running, I'm told, and people are able to begin making re re uh, reservations, uh, and they'll be, Amherst College is planning a series of uh, events um, in the run-up to the grand opening on January 5th. So we're tremendously excited about that and looking forward to it. Uh, next, also related to the downtown, uh, we are continuing our work with the uh, downtown business improvement district that you approved the creation of uh, at a meeting earlier this fall. Uh, the 30-day uh, period that allows the 270 or so property owners in the district to opt out of being a member. Uh, has passed. Uh, the vast, vast majority of those who indicated they would 
uh, participate as members uh, remain so. Uh, the uh, uh, Business Improvement District Steering Committee is working with town staff to, uh, and the town, uh, which will be the billing agent for the uh, district. Uh, they'll be, we're planning uh, a uh, uh, property tax bill, a separate bill uh, to go out on or around January 1st, which will be the first um, um, bill related to the getting the uh, district up and running. Uh, that will be uh, the effective date of the uh, district is the date of your vote back earlier in, in the fall. Um, so that's happening, um, and we're excited about that. There'll be a lot of action on that front uh, in the coming year. Um, um, what else? War Memorial Pool update. Um, we are still waiting for word from uh, the state on whether or not our grant application, uh, which would fund uh, up to 70% of the project cost, will be funded. Uh, we are uh, in constant communication with folks at the state. We are expecting to hear any day now. No, it's been any day now for about five weeks. Um, uh, we know that the final approvals for the grantees uh, award list was hung up in, as part of the state's overall capital budget planning. The capital uh, budget bottom line has been approved at the state level. So now it's a matter of allocating capital monies uh, within that cap. Um, the, uh, I have uh, uh, appointed Guilford Mooring, our DPW director, to be the project manager for this project. So he is in uh, overall charge of, of uh, bidding procedures and, and the actual construction management that will occur. We expect, uh, uh, We've been waiting to hear about the grant because we are being very conscious of not awarding uh, contracts or, or spending money on things that could later be ruled ineligible if we award those uh, contracts prior to the grant award. So we're, we're getting down to the wire here where we need to get moving. Uh, and really our window here is really between now and the end of next week. So we're, we're very hopeful we'll hear before the end of next week on the grant, and then we're in a position to move on what needs to be done. We have a project timeline uh, that uh, would result in construction work being completed on or around June 1st, which then leaves the month of June for filling the pool, the balancing of the chemicals for the pool water, those types of things, and final prep uh, with the goal of having our opening at a regular time uh, for next summer, uh, that last week of June. Questions or comments about the pool? Okay, so uh, next week's meeting you will know, uh, hopefully you may know about the grant, we always hope to know about the grant, and whether you know or not, you'll know uh, kind of what this town's plan is because it doesn't know about the grant, if it doesn't. Right, the town meeting vote was clear that the money was appropriated for this project uh, with or without a state grant. So I want to be clear, it's our intention as a town to uh, uh, complete this project so that the pool can open at the end of June. So we're, we are trying to minimize the cost to uh, Amherst taxpayers by, uh, we think we've submitted a very competitive grant and uh, we're, we're cautiously optimistic we'll be funded. We just haven't gotten the official, uh, the official word yet from Boston. But we're committed to the project. Town meeting is committed in a unanimous vote uh, at the November town meeting to uh, proceed with this project. Thank you. Uh, recent and upcoming activity, uh, I just wanted to note, and I know the board is aware of this, uh, uh, Tim Banks, an 18-year Town of Amherst employee for the Department of Public Works, uh, passed away uh, on Thanksgiving Day, and uh, a number of us uh, attended uh, the services for Tim. He was a, a long-standing employee, uh, had leadership positions in the union at one point, and was a was a very well-respected 
uh, employee for the town and will miss his uh, camaraderie and his, his service greatly. Um, other personnel uh, issues, uh, the code enforcement officer in the building department. Uh, we are in the midst of interviews for that position. Uh, I expect to be able to make an appointment announcement within the next 10 days to two weeks. Uh, and uh, depending on that person's uh, transition and availability, we hope to have the person start with us uh, sometime in the month of January. And we'll, there's much work to be done in that area, and we're eager to, eager to move forward. We're, we're encouraged by the caliber of the pool, and uh, you, you'll be hearing an announcement from me shortly. Um, other things, uh, it's kind of a behind the scenes thing, but w w uh, I'm heavily involved with uh, Sandy Pooler, our finance director and, and department heads and staff in, in uh, uh, budget development for the fiscal year that begins next July. I'll be presenting my uh, recommendations uh, in mid-January, and I know that at next Monday's select board meeting, I'll be giving you a kind of a big picture status of where I am in the planning and uh, talk about how that uh, is responsive to your uh, budget guidelines that you've developed. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Mr. Musanti? Excellent. Then moving right along. Uh, member reports. We have first up is a BCG update. Um, you have on your desks a hard copy of something I uh, forwarded to you earlier today. Um, budget coordinating group met specifically to discuss the other post-employment benefits or OPEB obligation liability that the town has. And this was the first discussion. We've, we've kind of had presentations on this. We had a very big presentation on this a year ago at our four boards meeting. Um, but the finance committee really wanted to have all the different elements of the town uh, budget making groups talk together about um, what kind of a policy we might all agree on for funding this because these are employees of the town schools and libraries and, um, and because the region is also, the regional schools is also a significant uh, portion of our current uh, uh, employees and our future retirees um, to have that be part of the discussion. So uh, there had been thinking a while back that at this fall town meeting we might actually have a recommendation on how to start funding the OPEB trust fund that the town meeting established last spring. But because this this whole discussion hadn't happened yet, they they put off that recommendation. So last week we met to talk specifically about that and to try and make sure that we're all kind of on the same page with what uh, what the OPEB uh, obligation is, and that's all about paying for health care, the employer's share of health care benefits to retirees. Um, and that cost is estimated currently to be $74 million. Um, the summary points for this BCG meeting just kind of outline what the, the, the basics of, of having us all understand what the obligation is and then about what the, um, some of the questions are for establishing a policy going forward. So um, I won't go through all of the summary points in detail because you have them to read. But, um, but as I said, the, the first one is really all about describing it um, and then the, the questions of of the policy decisions that will ultimately have to be made. Um, the, we're, we're very much in the education phase of this right now, where we're talking about it at the different boards and committees. Select Board has probably spent a little more time on it than other boards and committees. Um, it will also be an issue on the agenda at the four towns meeting. The first four towns meeting will be January 7th. Uh, you folks probably already have that on your calendars. I hope you do, because you were notified of it a long time ago. But this is the region, the, the me meeting that the region hosts with the uh, the school committees, finance committees, and select boards of all the towns in the region. So we'll also be having an OPEB discussion there as well. Um, and so some of the things that we're talking about as, as we think about how to create a policy uh, for funding this going forward um, is 
does this become something that is funded across, kind of evenly across the whole budget, or is it looking specifically at apportioning it within the different operating budgets? So, which is to say, you know, would you sort of take it off the top, that X number of dollars comes off the town budget before you start going into the different um, the different budget areas, or would this be something that you're saying, okay, well, you know, X percent of this is really covering, you know, school retirees and X percent or whatever. So so that's part of the policy discussion. Um, and also making sure that the, uh, that the other towns in the region are thinking similarly about this because how, how you would assess that, uh, the payment for the region, um, if it were to set up a trust fund similar to what the town has done, will be a big question and a significant issue for each of the towns who are participating. So, so they all need to be part of the conversation. And I'll just note that the regional schools were to entertain, I believe it's this week, uh, a recommendation to establish an OPEB trust fund just like the town of Amherst has done. And so again, they, they will need to answer the question of how to fund it as we go forward. So um, the, that these summary points were just to kind of bring us, and as I said, really it's a, a lot of it is the other boards and committees who may have not paid as much attention to this as we have up to speed on things. Um, but if you have any questions or comments about it that uh, Ms. Brewer and myself could bring back to BCG, then do let me know. And does Ms. Brewer or Mr. Musanti have anything else to add to the summary of what happened at BCG? Uh, I don't. Uh, um, uh, just reinforcing that we really are in the education phase on this issue, and I was... Uh, uh, the town, obviously, has spent quite a bit of time on this subject, as has the Finance Committee. Uh, I was very, very pleased and encouraged to see the uh, regional school committee and the Amherst School Committee through its budget subcommittee really beginning to grapple with this. And it's great because we're really now getting into the nitty gritty and the dialogue about how to approach this. So it's, I think we're off to a good, good start. Is there anything you want to add on that? I'll stick with that. Okay. Um, so any, any questions or feedback about the BCG summary points? Okay, you'll be hearing a lot more about this as time goes on. Um, that group meets again uh, at the end of January, so you won't hear anything about it until then, but uh, we'll meet again after the governor's budget, but you can expect more of this conversation that select board is involved in at that four boards meeting, uh, four towns meeting in January. <clears throat> All right, other liaison representative reports? Anyone, Mr. Hayden? Just, just one, it's uh, unfortunately this happened before, uh, after our last meeting and before this one, but this weekend the Public Shade Tree Committee sponsored a, um, a workshop to help people who've had uh, trees damaged on their property by the, by the storm. I think it was an, an excellent thing. I just wanted to mention that they're very active in that. Um, Alan Snow, who was here earlier and could have spoken to it maybe, um, described how uh, to take, uh, this storm had a particular particularly devastating effect on trees in that it tore the limbs off, which is very damaging. And he described ways to handle that kind of damage specifically, as well as uh, teaching you how to handle your chainsaw safely. So. Was that well attended? Uh, you know, I couldn't make it, so I don't know. I, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful thing for the town to have offered, and I, I hope that folks were able to take advantage of it. Ms. Stein? I guess I should report on the progress with the flag. Uh, which is that uh, Barry Mosier has, in fact, come up with a, uh, about t nine designs, possible designs, and they have been forwarded to the Historical Commission and the Design Review Board for consideration and choice, and there could be some tweaking amongst them. So um, it's nice to know after all these months that progress has been made. Um, what's the expectation of things going forward? Any idea? Um, I don't know. Uh, last time, DRB and the Historical Commission had a joint meeting and discussed it, but at the moment, it's the individual committees, um, groups that are going to discuss it, and I, I really am not sure. It's ultimately, we're going to get a recommendation, which we can approve or not approve, but it's at least moving forward. Wonderful. Thank and you. the designs are very lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Questions or comments on that or anything? Mr. Wald? Both those, <coughs> both those committees uh, 
to which I serve as liaison a meeting this week. So they have been, as Ms. Stein mentioned, they've received the designs and these are on the agenda. And we're assuming there'll be a joint meeting at some point too, but they just have to process it first. I don't know about it. So I'm gonna try to ask this week about a specific schedule and see if I can find out what they might do. Great, thank you. Uh, other liaison representative reports? Ms. Brewer. How come I have a long list and you don't? That's so unusual. Yeah, it's a quiet week and it's late over that. <laughs> <laughs> That's so odd. Um, a couple of things I'll try and be succinct. Um, the new housing and shelter committee still needs applicants. I'm still looking for suggestions as to how we find some of the people that have the qualifications that we suggested in the charge because just you know, saying, hey, we're accepting applicants isn't doing anything. On the other hand, I do understand that during this holiday season is really not people's first thought is let's go volunteer on a committee. So um, the first thing that that committee would really want to do would be to weigh in on the CPA proposals that will be you know, starting to be looked at in the new year. And we don't know of anything huge coming through housing wise, but still that would be perhaps one of their first tasks. So please bear that in mind and looking for people associated with that charge. Um, along those lines, we have all received my request, a list of the committees and boards so that we can kind of refamiliarize ourselves with where we are with that in terms of possible vacancies, et cetera, because we've been in kind of, with so much else going on, town meeting, et cetera, it has not been a major priority of myself and Ms. Stein to uh, get those committees fully populated. <clears throat> Wanted to mention that Leisure Services Commission, one of the things that I have been um, serving as liaison for them to do was actually to kind of push them along a little bit from the standpoint of taking more advantage of the commissioner's uh, work and, um, how do I want to say, possible promotion opportunities themselves such that so that when a budget, for example, is presented by a leisure services director or presented at town meeting that the leisure services commission itself would say, you know, we've been talking about these projects, we're community members, and we think these are all really good ideas rather than them just kind of being in the background somewhere. So they, in fact, were able this time this year to talk about the budget before it fully got presented by the director to the town manager. So we are making progress progress in that area and so that's good to see and taking full you know using our committees in ways that um, I know I'm saying using and things in ways that maybe doesn't sound great but I think are uh, important pieces of their charges the community development block grant advisory committee is trying to set up a meeting before the holidays although again obviously time is getting tight so that they can make sure they don't lose the thread of conversation about what they want to look at in the spring in terms of data review so that they have the information that they'd like to have next time they're ready to review applications so that's good to see keeping focus on that despite all the other things that are going on the regional school district planning committee that I'm serving on um, as your select board representative and Andy Steinberg from finance committee and Catherine Oppie from the Amherst school committee is also trying to set a meeting for the week of the 19th so we'll see how that goes and um, as you may recall there were you know, it was very specific in the town meeting motion it ended up being that there were going to be six meetings um, focused on these particular issues etc but um, Ms. Oppie is in charge of that right now and we'll get us started on that I think that's all I have questions or comments from Ms. Brewer anyone else is on reports Mr. Aiden. yeah I just wanted to mention that the recycling and refuse management committee um, are planning an exciting trip to the Oh, the MRF, the MRF, the something recycling, municipal recycling facility, um, which is just by way of, of saying that um, they are getting to, they're engaging with the issue of what to do, uh, what creative things can be done when the landfills are all closed, as they will be very soon. Our transfer station goes away under two years now, I think we'll no, be no longer able to operate it, which means that the refuse is going to have to go someplace, and we'll find out where that is pretty soon. Why can't we operate it after two years? I don't recall what, what the issue is there. I, I, I'm embarrassed to say. I'm hoping that John does. Uh, that, that's far from a done deal, but the, the main issue is where we ultimately bring our non-recyclable waste. 
a, a number of the la regional landfills that we bring our waste to will be reaching capacity or, or closing, such as Northampton and uh, a few others. So that's impacting our cost projections going forward. Yeah, there was, um, they had a forum several weeks ago about that day, the Refuse and Recycling Management Committee. And what I hadn't understood, I hadn't thought about actually, is the impact that the cost of non-recyclables has on not only the homeowners, I mean, clearly we all have, have to get rid of our garbage somehow or other, but also on businesses in town. It was well attended by business, uh, by, by um, contractors, for instance, who would come in and remodel your kitchen. Well, you know, changing a kitchen or building a family room or whatever creates a large amount of refuse, and that's what would be sort of the thing that would be most impacted by having to travel so much further to, uh, to get to a landfill if, um, and one of the, the gentlemen at the, the, uh, at the forum mentioned his, his recycling project. He just basically um, takes um, construction waste and dumps it on the floor and sorts it out so it can all be recycled. It can either be you know, taken just for scrap wood or you know, concrete can be turned back into aggregate um, and plaster can, I don't know what they do with plaster, they do something with it. Um, as well as the other obviously recyclable materials like glass and metals. So uh, more as that develops. Thank you. Ms. Brewer. I actually do have a question that perhaps the town manager could put on his list for a someday item, which is the um, letting us know a little bit more about the transfer station because there has been this sort of underlying concept that you know, it's one thing, because I, I think of it as a lot more than just the contractors being able to dump their stuff and individual people taking their one little bag of garbage there every so often. It's, of course, the recycling ability as well as the book shed and all that kind of stuff. And if people are talking about closing that in two years versus not closing it, I've already heard some comments from neighbors that, of course, that thing's going to close soon and we're not going to and we won't have to hear those trucks anymore. And I was like, not really clear on where we are on that. And, you know, two years would be here before we know it. So if we just have sort of an idea of where we're going because of all the different issues that are involved in that. Some update, that'd be great. Okay. Any other liaison reports? I'll just note, um, Campus and Community Coalition, um, I didn't mention this at the last meeting, but uh, they, we learned there that uh, campus-wide through the, I think it was through the um, student Affairs Office, they put together what you probably read about in the paper last week, this, I can't even remember the name of it now, but it was um, like our campus, our night, or something like that thing for Friday night mm -hmm. that they were working to put together a whole bunch of activities that was essentially starting with like the hockey game and then going into all kinds of late night stuff. Um, they were doing like an amazing race team that was doing fun things through campus. They had karaoke, they had a bunch of different musical acts, they had um, just cupcakes <laughs> they had all kinds of Decorating different it. kinds of it's food well and entertainment yes. and um, that was all in direct response to the fact that the town has been saying um, through our public safety through uh, different campus and community conversations that um, that there's a big sense out there that there isn't enough to do on campus when they you be you get these kind of marauding bands of students just walking down the street looking for something to do. So there isn't anything to do too often, and, and that's when folks get into trouble. Um, so uh, the the police chief and the fire chief uh, have been saying, and, and Mr. Musanti and I have been saying, well, you know, can you do more stuff on campus? What would that look like? What how would that work out? And um, and that means obviously a whole lot more work for people during times when they're not usually working. Um, but they really embraced that idea. And I didn't even realize that they were going to do it until the last Campus Community Coalition meeting. Um, I have no idea yet how it worked out. Um, obviously, you know, Mr. Kelly was here for public comment. It didn't keep every single student on campus and behaving that night. But um, but um, I know that the police chief was going to look at it and see what kind of a difference it made. Now, obviously, this was a cold weekend in December, which is not the same as a beautiful weekend in the spring. But I think that the, uh, that the 
university should really get a lot of credit for doing a test run of that, saying, okay, you know, here's, here's something that the town is telling us that we need to try more of. So now we're going to try this. We're going to see how it works and see what other things we might be able to do for the future. So I just, um, I just want to thank them for being so responsive, for really saying, okay, yeah, what would that look like and giving it a shot? And uh, I hope it was successful, and I hope it's something that could be really expanded on for the future because, um, cause, yeah, you know, when, when people get bored, they tend to make their own entertainment, and that could go well or go badly. So, uh, so who knows? So I, I'm looking forward to reports on that, and I, like I said, I don't know how it went, but, uh, but I do want to give them public credit for, for doing that. Um, okay, I don't have any other liaison reports. Uh, Ms. Brewer, anything on open meeting law? Um, yes, and then I have, I wanted to backtrack for just a moment. Actually, for open meeting law, no, except that if you are subscribed to the MMA uh, website notifications, you've seen that they've <clears throat> finally put that up, that the regulations were put out, and um, they, I still want to ask some clarifying questions, but hopefully they'll do some of that for us. It's so, on the remote participation. Yeah, on rem yes, exactly, associated with remote participation. I'm kind of waiting for us to not have to be the ones to nag about this. Let somebody else try and get some of these clarified. So that would be good. Um, one thing, actually a couple quick things I wanted to mention because I know we're all tired, but when you brought up Campus Community Coalition, I also wanted to mention that in, a, in addition to that being really great that the campus um, was so responsive to that, is that Campus Community Coalition continues to do all these little things that we don't necessarily hear about at this meeting, and Ms. O'Keefe hears about them, but for example, on greeting card day, I saw there were these t-shirts that were starting to circulate around town that um, associated with Campus Community Coalition, about 96%, I think, of student drive, uh, students who go out to party get a sober driver you know and that they they make positive choices like that and so having those messages out in the bars that they're out in seemed like you know it's just like they just have these continuous things that they're always trying new things even if we don't necessarily hear about a particular promotion thank you for bringing that up if i could just um uh, uh, emphasize that a little bit before you go on um so this was a, a project of that came out of university health services and their basics program but it was working with the retail partners so these are the liquor license licensees, um, most of whom attend the retail partners meetings, but also those who were getting to try and be part of retail partners. So they, uh, it was liquor stores, bars and restaurants had people wearing a light blue t-shirt saying that that message about, you know, that, that UMass students, this is part of their social norming campaign. They, and this is the same as like the messages you see on buses and stuff that try to, um, try to change what the expectation might be among the student body. And they might say, oh, you know, everybody, you know, drives drunk or whatever that, you know, nobody ever gets hurt. Well, that's not true. In fact, 95, 96% get a sober driver, make sure they have a sober driver. So they use that kind of social norming messages to, um, to try and change the perceptions out there. And so it was really wonderful that so many different establishments did participate in that. I really appreciate your mentioning that. Um, folks who didn't have, didn't wear t-shirts because it didn't go with their uh, you know, some places have to wear sort of a certain uniform. They would wear light blue buttons that had the same message on it. But really, it was a terrific, uh, it was a terrific thing for the retail partners to um, participate in and and help support that sober driving message. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. I wanted to um, completely randomly ask uh, the town manager to mention, which I will now mention, that the. Um, Big Y traffic light is finally supposedly going to be getting installed on Wednesday, which I heard from UMass, which I thought was interesting because UMass likes to put out these great notices that say, the town of Amherst is going to be doing something, call them if you want to complain. <laughs> but, um, it's great, though, that they get it out there because people travel that area that are just work at UMass who don't necessarily live in this area. So uh, that traffic light is something we've been much anticipating, and after the storm, we knew that, you know, the schedule got screwed up, so if that could happen before big snowfalls even, that would well, be wonderful. kudos to UMass for assisting with that <laughs> announcement. There was also an announcement uh, today, I believe, from the Hopefully DPW. The, town website. Uh, the work, I believe, is scheduled f uh, for this Wednesday. So yeah. People can watch for that. I think that's really important. And if I might, Ms. O'Keefe, one other thing I wanted to ask about about parking, since we had the you know the little follow-up mm -hmm. associated with trying to tweak that to get it just right, and come next year we'll no doubt again be saying exactly, let's do it exactly this way. I'd like to um, mention, and I did speak briefly with the chamber director last week, 
whose responsibility this whole project really is from the standpoint of promotion. I think the select board does a fine job in trying to figure out the best way to make it clear what we're approving of and to make it be something that will be useful to merchants and to <coughs> downtown visitors. But yet, at the same time, although, of course, the Gazette did very accurately report on what we intended to do with our parking, the greeting card that is a Gazette promotion, not a Chamber promotion, doesn't say anything about free parking on it when you get it. And the Chamber has a, not always gotten right on top of promoting that either. And yet, at the same time, we're all volunteers. And like our, the reason we have paid parking is so that parking turns over. It's not like our job, I think, to promote that we have free parking. So I hope that the community will think a little bit about how they want to hear about it and then talk to merchants and advertisers <clears throat> and newspapers about how they can best get the information rather than saying, how come I didn't know about this? Because I'm not really convinced that it's my fault they don't know about it. I think we've done about what we need to do. And so I'd like to see some, because why are we you know, struggling with it and, and taking the hit on the dollars when people don't even know and they're putting money in the meter anyway or whatever it seems a little silly. So I'm hoping that that will get handled elsewhere rather than that we need to make a bigger deal of it here within the select board. So I think um, I think this that kind of falls victim to what happens with a lot of things that you do over and over again and you just sort of forget that you're doing over and over again. You're not really kind of looking at them anew. And um, so um, so I have a note because Ms. Brewer and I have had this conversation already. I have a note in the master calendar for next year to um, communicate with the chamber in late October, early November and say, OK, how do we kind of take this up a notch? <laughs> how do we get the most leverage out of the efforts that the Chamber, the Gazette, and the uh, Select Board of the Town is putting forth to promote downtown businesses on these, these various days and during this time period? Um, we all need to be kind of, you know, getting credit for the effort, but also um, but not, not for the sake of credit, but so that... Um, so that the public knows this is this joint effort among all these folks to try and uh, promote business and to try and help people to shop locally and, and enjoy their time in the holiday season downtown. So uh, so I think it is kind of a, instead of just saying, okay, here we are again, and we're doing the same old thing, it's like stepping back and saying, okay, <laughs> how do we do this better next time? So noted, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, um, other issues before the chair's report? Um, okay, uh, I, I wanted to note that in your packets you had, because Ms. Brewer pointed out that uh, folks hadn't received a hard copy of the budget guidelines that we had approved previously, in case you like to keep copious folders of, <laughs> full of these things. Now you have your hard copy, of us who consider don't yet it have iPads. Yes. Um, <laughs> so that's why you have them, just to, so to make sure they had them. Um, vice chair rotation schedule. So this is just something that I was thinking of lately. Um, the way our schedule works is we uh, rotate the vice chair alphabetically every month, which works very well for us, and the select board's been doing it for years. I was just wondering if you might want to do anything that would have you sort of skip a month or do whatever such that you ended up with different months because at this point you always have exactly the same months every year <laughs> and that might be fine you know so everybody gets three months of, of being vice chair but you know sometimes you might have a month where we meet all the time or you might have a month that we meet you know very infrequently but the nature of our work is so cyclical that a lot of times we're dealing with exactly the same things in exactly the same ways during those time periods. So I'm throwing it out there to you folks. If you wanted to, you know, you, you, instead of starting January with whoever is next, you know, you would skip that person or you kept, you know, Ms. Brewer, who's currently it for, for two months or something, just so that your months would be offset a little bit. And maybe this doesn't matter to you at all, but I just want to throw that out there to you if, if that was interesting. It doesn't matter to me at all. <laughs> this stuff doesn't matter at all. Whatever you want, Stephanie. I, it it's doesn't make any difference to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. I hadn't Every even month noticed is my month. That so. I always <laughs> go on a certain month to tell you the truth. So, I mean, maybe some. Else cares, but I don't. Yeah. Does anyone care? 
No one cares. Not yet. Okay. <laughs> Very well. Ms. Brewer. Well, I just want to compliment you on bringing it up because back in the day when it used to be that certain things went with that, say, for example, committee appointments, there used to be this concept that the vice chair dealt with committee appointments. Well, it was pretty crazy to have the same person always be doing June then because yeah, right. that didn't make a lot of sense. But we've changed other things associated with that. And I think that certainly at this point, this board feels collegial enough that if we have a thing we want on the agenda, whether it's our month or not, we say, hey, we would really like to have this on the agenda. So I know that passports haven't always felt that way, but I think it is a, it's a it's a useful sort of brain thing to bring along because we know you're going to be chair for the next 50 years, but 51 year um, that uh, that people do keep this in mind that because if everybody doesn't get along as beautifully as we do, they may not feel that openness to being able to discuss that, and it is something that's worth mentioning every so often because if you really are tired of having August as your month, you know maybe you could be switched out. Just throwing that out there. If you ever want to change it, you know, just let me know. Okay, anything else in the chair's report? Recent upcoming activity. Um, this week, I think it's tomorrow, actually, Mr. Musanti and I are meeting with um, the new vice chancellor for administration and finance of the university just to meet him and, uh, and uh, make that acquaintance. Um, so we can have information about that next time. I don't think I have any other particularly interesting recent and upcoming information. Um, I think we have a, another untimed item or two to deal with mm -hmm. before we get to calendar preview. Ms. Brewer. Could we, um, is it time yet, time yet on our schedule to, in terms of our monthly schedule, to add the budget update to untimed items? Simply because, for example, the thing I made a note of while they were here and then totally forgot while the assessors after they left, is that because of the recommendations we saw that they received from the state which said that it was based on their own recommendations. I was a little confused by that. But all these 2015 recommendations, some of which will clearly require some resources associated with personnel or money, that's the kind of thing that we could now start saying, are we planning that these will be done by 2015? Are these even in the pipeline, et cetera? You know, that kind of, that kind of hear there sorts of questions that we can check in with the town manager on. Yeah, so um, so I think what we've done in the past is that it's after the budget has been presented to us, then okay. we always have the budget update because it's either us asking questions as we've right. had a chance to read more and more of the document or the fact that things are happening at the state level, you know, they, that, that we need to be updated on. Um, are you raising your Yeah, just um, reminding you that um, the budget proposal itself will have both performance objectives for the next fiscal year, but also long-term objectives. So if there are long-term uh, objectives or needs, such as the one you just mentioned in terms of how we do this measure and list program, for example, uh, for all the properties in town, that will be referenced in long-term objectives. And if there's a budgetary, potential budgetary impact, we're gonna try to flag that as part of that. One of the, uh, things we've been able to do successfully in Amherst is to do our revaluation work almost exclusively with in-house personnel at a savings of hundreds of thousands of dollars every single revaluation. And that, uh, you know, um, but I, I have the DOR advice there as well. And so we'll, we'll address those in the budget document, I hope. Right, at in least terms of the long term. Right. Great. So yes and yes, we'll have the we'll have the budget <laughs> update information that was my way on to the say agenda yes. <laughs> and uh, exactly. and the, the issues That's that you're talking about will be dealt to frame it. So thank you. All right, um, let's see. So we still need to do the special liquor license. Special liquor license. <clears throat> Shall I do it? Please. I move that the select board <clears throat> approve a special wine and malt license for Sarah Rodriguez on behalf of Amherst College for a karaoke night to be held at the Keefe Campus Center from 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. December 7, 2011. And it was noted that 2 was an hour later than usual, but I didn't see any problem with it. So I made the motion as it stood. Second. Thank you. Uh, for the discussion, and we have Mr. Hayden and then Ms. Musanti. Matter, well, I will say that I work for Amherst. We grant them all kinds of special licenses. Yeah, yeah, but thank you. Just to mention. Noted, yes, Mr. Musanti. Just Mishanti. making the point that on the 2 a.m. 
time uh, uh, requested. Um, our staff, including the police chief, have reviewed that and are comfortable with the That's license exactly. as recommended. I also followed up further with the office on this today um, to have them check with uh, the fire chief in case they were concerned about ambulance impacts, the kind of thing uh, Mr. Kelly was talking about in public comment. Um, they had no problem with that for school sanctioned events. And additionally, in case anyone was wondering how many licenses had been um, granted to Amherst College under this person's name, I think this is only the second one. This is either the second or the third. I can't remember if the information was that this is the second or there have been two previous. But anyway, it's way below the limit. So. Um, all right, further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. And we have a committee appointment also. I move that the select board appoint Sharin Hakeem Amherst Mass to the Human Rights Commission effective December 5th, 2011 for a term to expire June 30th, 2014. Second. Further discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 And that is unanimous. Okay, did we get every one of our necessary motions? I yes. think we did. All right, looking ahead, um, the calendar preview. Next meeting is our last meeting, we hope, unless something weird comes up, um, of uh, 2011. Um, at this point, we are expecting uh, the budget update Mr. Musanti talked about, uh, more license renewal, talk about taxi business plans. Also at this point, expect an executive session. We're probably going to have another uh, collective bargaining uh, update at that point. So just so you can plan accordingly. Also, I've talked to the office about talking to the folks at UMass in particular, but also Amherst College about trying to get any special liquor license um, applications in knowing that that's our our last meeting you know they've got all the holiday parties and everything and and we don't want to convene a, you know a whole bunch of quickie meetings just to do special liquor licenses but you never know um so then that gets us to january and uh and january will be a whole new year a whole new bunch of issues and big focus on the budget at that point so um so things are things are kind of quiet for the next couple of weeks but then we get seriously into budget time miss brewer I'm sorry, I think I should probably know this, but um, the, we had originally talked about, we saw some email go back and forth about the personnel board and the fact that it, you know, for various reasons, it wasn't gonna work out for them to come tonight. Do, did that go to January? Do we know a date certain it in January? It is probably gonna be January. Um, it will be January, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Okay. Um, it will, they are actually making some amendments, having some discussion. Okay for some changes that came in at the last minute about the library trustees and that sort of thing. So it probably won't be till that 23rd meeting then looking I, at this at list. At the moment, I would guess, because okay. one of Great. the things we need is an opinion from council. Oh, well, <laughs> and, in that case. And it could be there for a long time <laughs> since some of us have been waiting six months for an opinion from council. No comment beyond that. No, four months, <laughs> let me not exaggerate. Okay. okay, so it's it's in the pipeline probably. Right, January but it's 23rd. not, yeah. It won't yeah. be like the, it isn't going to be one of those first meetings right. because of the other things no. we've got going on. Right. Uh, Originally, so. I had thought we would do it next time, but it's not going to work out. So is there anything else anybody needs to talk about before we meet again in seven days? This is one of our uh, meetings close together times. If not, then without objection, this meeting adjourns at 8.57. Second. Thank you. Good night.